The lighthouse stood on a rugged stretch of coastline where the waves crashed violently against the rocks and the wind howled through the night. I was the keeper, and my name is Isaac Palmer. This wasn't just a job. It was my life. I'd grown up around lighthouses, with my father and grandfather both serving as keepers. There was something about the isolation, the raw beauty, and the responsibility that drew me in. It was the late 1970s, a time when life moved a little slower, and the lighthouse still served as a crucial navigational aid. The nearest town was a good 20 miles away, a small fishing village where everyone knew each other's business. Out here, though, it was just me and the sea. My days were filled with routine maintenance, keeping the light in working order and watching the horizon. Nights were long and lonely, with only the sound of the foghorn and the endless ocean to keep me company. I had a small radio for news and occasional music, but mostly it was silence. It was during one of those long nights that things began to change. I first noticed it on a foggy night in October. The fog rolled in thick and heavy, shrouding the world in a dense white veil. I was in the watch room, making sure the light cut through the mist, when I saw a figure on the rocks below. It was a woman, her dress billowing in the wind, standing perilously close to the edge. I grabbed my flashlight and hurried down the spiral staircase, my boots clanging against the metal steps. By the time I reached the door and rushed outside, she was gone. There was no sign of anyone on the rocks, and the fog had swallowed everything. I called out, but my voice was lost in the wind. I returned to the lighthouse, shaken but unsure of what I'd seen. Maybe it was a trick of the light, I told myself, or just my mind playing games in the isolation. The next morning I went into town for supplies. I mentioned the woman to old man Higgins, the owner of the general store. He frowned, his weathered face creasing with concern. Isaac, you be careful out there. There's been talk of strange happenings along the coast. People seeing things that ain't there. I nodded, but dismissed it. Isolation could do strange things to a person, and I wasn't about to let a foggy night spook me. But as the days turned into weeks, more strange occurrences began to unfold. I'd hear whispers in the wind, faint and unintelligible, and see fleeting shadows out of the corner of my eye. It was unnerving, but I chalked it up to the loneliness. One night, as I was preparing the light for the evening, I found a small, old-fashioned locket on the rocks. It was tarnished and looked like it had been there for decades. I opened it to find a faded photograph of a woman and a young child. The woman looked eerily similar to the figure I'd seen on the rocks. Curiosity peaked. I took the locket back to the lighthouse and examined it closely. There were initials engraved on the back. E.M. I decided to ask around in town the next time I went for supplies. Perhaps someone would know more about it. When I showed the locket to old man Higgins, his face turned pale. That there belonged to Eleanor Morgan. She and her boy disappeared back in 42. Never found a trace of them. Some say she drowned herself and the boy after her husband died at sea. Others say it was something else. Something else? I asked, feeling a chill despite the warm day. Some say the lighthouse is cursed, that there's a darkness there, something that took Eleanor and her boy. I left the store with a heavy heart, the locket burning a hole in my pocket. That night I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about Eleanor and her son and the possibility that something more sinister was at play. The following weeks were a blur of strange events. The whispers grew louder, almost as if someone was speaking directly into my ear. Objects would move on their own, and I'd find wet footprints leading from the door to the light. My nights were filled with restless dreams of drowning, and I woke up gasping for breath. One particularly stormy night the power went out. The lighthouse plunged into darkness, and I had to light the old oil lamps to see. As I climbed the stairs to the watch room, I felt a cold draft and heard a soft sobbing. I followed the sound to find the figure of a woman, drenched and shivering, standing by the light. Her face was pale, her eyes hollow. Eleanor? I whispered, my voice trembling. She turned to me, her eyes filled with sorrow and fear. Help us, she said, her voice a mere breath. He won't let us go. Who? I asked but she vanished before my eyes, leaving only the lingering scent of salt and sea. 
I spent the rest of the night in a daze, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. I knew then that this was no ordinary haunting. There was something malevolent at work, something that had taken Eleanor and her son and was now coming for me. Desperate, I searched through the lighthouse records, looking for any clue that might explain the curse. I found old logs dating back to the early 1900s, filled with accounts of strange happenings and disappearances. It seemed that every few decades someone would vanish without a trace, and each time it coincided with the appearance of the fog. Determined to break the cycle, I decided to confront whatever was haunting the lighthouse. The next foggy night, I waited in the watchroom, the locket in my hand. I felt a chill in the air and heard the familiar whispers. This time, I didn't run. I stood my ground. The figure of Eleanor appeared again, her form flickering like a candle flame. You have to help us, she pleaded. He's coming. Who is he? I demanded. Before she could answer, a dark shadow loomed behind her. It was a man, tall and imposing, with eyes that burned like coals. His presence filled the room with an oppressive weight, and I could barely breathe. This is my domain, he growled. You have no place here. I realized then that this was no ghost. This was something far older and more powerful, a demon, perhaps, or some ancient spirit that had claimed the lighthouse as its own. You need to leave, I said, my voice steady despite the fear coursing through me. You need to let them go. He laughed, a sound like stones grinding together. They are mine, and now so are you. With a surge of courage, I held up the locket. I don't think so. This belongs to Eleanor. It's time for you to leave. The shadow recoiled, its form wavering. No, it hissed. You cannot banish me. But I could feel its power waning. The light from the locket grew brighter, filling the room with a warm, golden glow. The shadow shrieked and dissipated, leaving only the sound of the waves and the wind. Eleanor's figure stood before me, her expression one of relief and gratitude. Thank you, she said, her voice fading. We're free now. With that, she vanished, and the lighthouse was still. The air felt lighter, and the oppressive weight was gone. I knew then that the curse had been broken. In the days that followed, the strange occurrences ceased. The whispers, the shadows, the wet footprints, all of it stopped. The fog still rolled in from time to time, but it no longer brought with it a sense of dread. I took the locket to the town cemetery and buried it next to the grave of Eleanor's husband. It felt like the right thing to do, a final act of closure for the woman and her son. As I stood there, looking out at the sea, I felt a sense of peace. The lighthouse, once a place of fear and darkness, had become a beacon of hope once more. And though the memories of that night would stay with me, I knew that I had done the right thing. Life went on, and I continued my duties as the lighthouse keeper. But I never forgot Eleanor her son, or the darkness that had haunted us. It was a reminder that even in the most isolated places, the past could reach out and touch the present. And sometimes it took a little courage to set things right. Years later, when I finally retired, I left the lighthouse in the hands of a new keeper. As I drove away, I took one last look at the towering structure, standing tall against the sky. It had been my home, my sanctuary, and my battleground. And I knew that no matter what, its light would continue to shine, guiding sailors safely through the storm. It was the summer of 1978, a time when the world seemed simpler, and my life revolved around the steady rhythms of the sea. I was the lighthouse keeper of Dune Point, a remote and desolate stretch of the coast, where the Atlantic's relentless waves crashed against jagged rocks. It was a place of solitude, a sanctuary away from the chaos of city life. Little did I know, it was also the setting for a mystery that would haunt me forever. My name is Harold Brindle, and I had been the keeper at Dune Point for nearly a decade. The lighthouse was my domain, my refuge, and my prison. The nearest town was a good forty miles away, reachable only by a winding, treacherous road. 
Supplies were delivered once a month by a weathered old fisherman named Albie, who brought news from the mainland along with the essentials. The lighthouse itself was a towering structure of weather-beaten brick and iron, standing sentinel against the encroaching sea. It had been built in the 1800s and had withstood countless storms and tempests. Inside, it was a maze of narrow staircases, dimly lit corridors, and creaking floorboards. The keeper's quarters were at the base, a modest set of rooms furnished with the basics. A bed, a table, a few chairs, and a wood-burning stove that was my only source of warmth during the brutal winter months. One evening in early August, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the sky turned a deep shade of purple, I settled into my routine. I lit the lamp and began my rounds, checking the light and making sure everything was in working order. The beacon cast its reassuring glow across the waves, guiding ships safely through the treacherous waters. It was on one of these rounds that I first noticed something strange. A figure stood at the edge of the cliffs, silhouetted against the darkening sky. It was a man, tall and thin, dressed in old-fashioned clothes. He seemed to be staring out at the sea, unmoving. I called out to him, but there was no response. Curious and a little uneasy, I made my way down the winding staircase and out into the cold night air. When I reached the spot where the figure had stood, there was no one there. The wind whipped at my clothes, and the sound of the crashing waves filled my ears. I scanned the area but found nothing. Just as I was about to turn back, I noticed something on the ground. A small, leather-bound journal, weathered and stained with salt. I picked it up and examined it under the light of the lantern. The cover bore no name, only the initials J.D., embossed in gold. Back in my quarters, I sat by the stove and opened the journal. The pages were filled with neat, precise handwriting, detailing the life of a man named Jonathan Drake, who had been the lighthouse keeper at Dune Point in the late 1800s. As I read, a chilling story began to unfold. Jonathan Drake had come to Dune Point with his wife, Eliza, in the spring of 1876. They had been newlyweds, eager to start their life together in the solitude of the lighthouse. But their happiness had been short-lived. Eliza had fallen ill shortly after their arrival, and despite Jonathan's best efforts, she had succumbed to a fever that summer. Devastated by her death, Jonathan had buried her in a small plot near the cliffs and continued his duties alone. The entries grew increasingly erratic and desperate as Jonathan wrote about strange occurrences at the lighthouse. He described seeing ghostly apparitions, hearing whispers in the wind, and feeling an oppressive presence that seemed to watch him at all times. His final entry was the most disturbing of all. August 12, 1877. The night is dark and the sea is restless. I can hear her voice calling to me from the cliffs. Eliza, my love, my heart aches for you. I must go to her. She waits for me in the depths of the sea. The journal ended there with no further explanation. I closed the book, my hands trembling. The story had unnerved me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it than just the ravings of a grief-stricken man. I decided to investigate further, hoping to find some answers. Over the next few days, I combed through the lighthouse records and local archives. What I found was both fascinating and horrifying. Jonathan Drake had indeed been the keeper at Dune Point, and his wife Eliza had died under mysterious circumstances. Her death had been officially attributed to a fever, but rumors suggested otherwise. Some locals believed that Jonathan had gone mad with grief and had taken his own life by throwing himself into the sea. Others whispered of a curse that haunted the lighthouse, claiming that Eliza's spirit still lingered, seeking revenge. As I delved deeper into the history of the lighthouse, I began to experience strange occurrences myself. At night, I would hear faint whispers and footsteps echoing through the halls. Objects would move on their own, and the temperature would drop suddenly, sending shivers through my body. The figure on the cliffs appeared more frequently, always watching, always silent. One night, unable to sleep, I decided to confront whatever was haunting the lighthouse. Armed with a lantern and the journal, I made my way to the cliffs where Jonathan had buried Eliza. The moon was full, casting an eerie glow over the landscape. As I approached the gravesite, I felt a cold breeze brush against my face, and the whispers grew louder, more insistent. 
I stood by the grave and read aloud from Jonathan's final entry. The wind howled around me, and the waves crashed violently against the rocks. Suddenly I felt a presence behind me, and I turned to see the figure of the man standing there, his eyes filled with sorrow. Jonathan? I whispered, my voice trembling. The figure nodded slowly, and for a moment I saw a flicker of recognition in his eyes. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. Instead he pointed to the cliffs, then to the sea. I understood his message. He wanted me to find Eliza, to bring her peace. With renewed determination I set about searching for any clues that might lead me to Eliza's remains. I scoured the coastline, diving into the treacherous waters and exploring the hidden caves. It was a perilous task, but I was driven by a sense of duty and an overwhelming need to uncover the truth. After weeks of searching, I finally found what I was looking for. In a hidden cave, deep beneath the cliffs, I discovered a small makeshift tomb. Inside, wrapped in a tattered shroud, were the remains of a woman. I knew it had to be Eliza. Carefully, I gathered her bones and brought them back to the lighthouse. I decided to give Eliza a proper burial, hoping it would put her restless spirit to rest. With the help of Albie, the fisherman, we constructed a small coffin and held a simple ceremony by the cliffs. As we laid her to rest, I felt a sense of peace wash over me, and the oppressive presence that had haunted the lighthouse seemed to lift. But the story doesn't end there. As the weeks went by, the strange occurrences at the lighthouse ceased, and the figure on the cliffs disappeared. I thought I had finally put the past to rest, but then something happened that made me question everything. One evening, as I was tending to the light, I found a note slipped under my door. It was written in the same neat, precise handwriting as Jonathan's journal. The note read, Thank you, Harold, for giving my beloved Eliza the peace she deserved. But beware, for the curse of Dune Point is not so easily broken. The sea holds many secrets, and some are best left undisturbed. J.D. The note sent a chill down my spine, and I couldn't help but wonder if Jonathan's warning was true. Had I truly put the past to rest, or had I merely stirred up something far more sinister? As the years went by, I continued my duties as the lighthouse keeper, always vigilant, always watching. The peace I had felt after Eliza's burial was fleeting, and the whispers in the wind returned, more insistent than ever. The figure on the cliffs reappeared, joined by others, their eyes filled with sorrow and longing. I realized that the lighthouse was a beacon not just for ships, but for lost souls as well. It was a place where the past and the present intertwined, where the living and the dead coexisted. And as long as I remained its keeper, I knew I would never truly be alone. In the end, I came to accept my fate. The lighthouse was my home, my refuge, and my prison. It was a place of solitude, but also of mystery and wonder. And though the ghosts of Dune Point haunted me, I found solace in the knowledge that I was their guardian, their protector. So, if you ever find yourself on the desolate shores of Dune Point, look for the light that guides you through the darkness. And remember, some secrets are best left buried, for the sea holds many mysteries, and not all of them are meant to be discovered. As I sit here writing these words, I can hear the whispers once more. They are calling to me, urging me to join them in the depths of the sea. But I am not ready to leave just yet. There are still stories to be told, secrets to be uncovered, and mysteries to be solved. And so I remain, the lighthouse keeper of Dune Point, watching, waiting, and listening to the voices of the past. I never thought I'd be writing this, and I'm not sure anyone will believe me. I've kept this to myself for years, but I need to get it off my chest. The story begins in 1985, at a remote lighthouse where I worked as the keeper. The lighthouse stood on a rugged stretch of coastline, battered by relentless waves and howling winds. Its isolation was both a curse and a blessing. On clear nights, the beam of the lighthouse reached out over the dark ocean, guiding ships safely away from the treacherous rocks. But when the fog rolled in, the world shrank to the immediate vicinity of the lighthouse, and the sense of isolation was overwhelming. My name is Ray. 
I was a seasoned lighthouse keeper, used to the solitude and the monotonous rhythm of my daily tasks. The isolation never bothered me. I enjoyed the peace, the time to think, and the sound of the waves crashing against the rocks below. My only company was an old transistor radio and a scruffy cat named Whiskers who kept the mice at bay. The story starts one October evening. A thick fog had rolled in, making it impossible to see more than a few feet in front of the lighthouse. I was in the kitchen, making a cup of coffee, when I heard a strange noise coming from outside. It was a faint, rhythmic tapping, like someone was knocking on the window. But I knew that was impossible. The lighthouse windows were fifty feet above the ground. I shook it off, thinking it was just the wind playing tricks on my mind. But then, Whiskers, who was usually unperturbed by anything, started hissing at the window. I walked over and peered out, but the fog was so thick I couldn't see a thing. I shrugged it off and went back to my coffee. Later that night, I was in the lighthouse tower, checking the light and making sure everything was in order. The fog made the night feel particularly eerie. As I made my rounds, I heard that tapping noise again, this time louder and more insistent. It was coming from the door at the base of the lighthouse. Who's there? I called out, but there was no answer. I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously made my way down the spiral staircase. When I reached the door, I paused for a moment, listening. The tapping had stopped. I opened the door and the cold, damp fog poured in. There was no one there. I stepped outside, shining my flashlight into the fog, but saw nothing. I was about to head back inside when I noticed something on the ground. It was a small, intricately carved wooden figurine, about six inches tall. It looked ancient, weathered by time and the elements. I picked it up and examined it. It was a figure of a woman. Her face twisted in a look of agony. I brought the figurine inside and set it on the table. I had no idea where it came from or who had left it there, but it gave me the creeps. That night, as I tried to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone in the lighthouse. I kept hearing noises, whispers, footsteps, and that persistent tapping. The next few days were uneventful, and I began to convince myself that I had imagined the whole thing. But then, one night, as I was sitting in the living room reading a book, I heard the tapping again. This time it was coming from the attic. I had never been in the attic. It was dusty and full of old junk from previous lighthouse keepers. I grabbed my flashlight and made my way up the narrow staircase to the attic. The door creaked as I pushed it open, and the smell of must and decay hit me. I shone my flashlight around the room, illuminating old furniture, boxes, and cobwebs. In the corner, I saw something that made my blood run cold. It was the same wooden figurine, sitting on an old dusty chest. I knew I had left it downstairs on the table. There was no way it could have moved by itself. My hands were shaking as I picked it up. As I did, I felt a cold draft and the door slammed shut behind me. I dropped the figurine and ran to the door, but it was stuck. I was trapped in the attic. I pounded on the door, shouting for help, but I knew there was no one around for miles. I sat down, trying to calm myself. That's when I heard it. A faint whispering, like someone was speaking in a language I couldn't understand. The sound was coming from the chest. I felt a chill run down my spine as I slowly approached it. With trembling hands, I opened the chest. Inside, I found old papers, photographs, and a journal. The photographs were old black and white, showing the lighthouse and its keepers over the years. But there was something strange about them. In each photograph, there was a shadowy figure in the background, almost imperceptible, but definitely there. I picked up the journal and started reading. It belonged to a previous lighthouse keeper named Jacob, who had worked here in the early 1900s. As I read his entries, I felt a growing sense of dread. Jacob wrote about strange occurrences similar to what I was experiencing, the tapping, the whispers, the feeling of being watched. He believed the lighthouse was haunted by the spirit of a woman who had drowned nearby. According to Jacob's journal, the woman was a local legend. She was said to have been a witch, executed by the townspeople for practicing dark magic. Her spirit was bound to the lighthouse, and she tormented anyone who stayed there. Jacob wrote that he had found a way to communicate with her through the wooden figurine. He believed that the figurine was a conduit, a way for her to channel her energy. 
As I read Jacob's final entry, my heart sank. He wrote that he couldn't take it anymore, that the spirit was driving him mad. He planned to take his own life to escape her torment. I realized with horror that Jacob's body was never found. He had simply disappeared. I knew I had to get out of the attic. I took the journal and the figurine and pounded on the door again. This time it opened easily. I rushed downstairs and locked the attic door behind me. I spent the rest of the night in the living room, clutching the journal and the figurine, unable to sleep. The next morning I decided I needed to get out of the lighthouse. I packed a bag and was about to leave when I heard a knock at the door. I opened it to find a man standing there. He introduced himself as Tom, a historian researching the lighthouse's history. Tom noticed the journal and the figurine and asked if he could take a look. I told him everything that had happened, and he listened intently. When I finished, he looked at me with a mix of fear and fascination. He told me that he had heard stories about the lighthouse, but he never believed them until now. Tom suggested we try to communicate with the spirit, to find out what she wanted. I was hesitant, but I agreed. We set up a makeshift seance in the living room, placing the figurine in the center of the table. Tom began to speak, asking the spirit to show herself. At first, nothing happened. But then the room grew cold, and the lights flickered. We heard the whispering again, louder this time. The figurine started to move, sliding across the table toward Tom. He reached out to touch it, and the moment his fingers brushed it, he let out a scream and collapsed. I rushed to his side, but he was unconscious. I tried to wake him, but he wouldn't respond. I had no choice but to wait and hope he would recover. As I sat there, I felt a presence in the room. I knew the spirit was there, watching me. After what felt like hours, Tom finally woke up. He looked at me with wide, terrified eyes. He said he had seen her, the spirit of the woman. She was angry, vengeful, and she wanted something from us. But he didn't know what. Tom and I spent the next few days trying to piece together the history of the lighthouse and the woman's story. We discovered that her name was Eliza, and she had been accused of witchcraft and drowned by the townspeople in the late 1800s. Her spirit had been bound to the lighthouse ever since, tormenting anyone who stayed there. We knew we had to find a way to appease her, to break the curse. We decided to hold another seance, this time with the intention of offering her a proper burial. We gathered some of her personal items that we had found in the attic, along with the figurine, and made our way to the spot where she had drowned. As we performed the ritual, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The air grew warmer and the whispers faded away. When we finished, we saw a figure standing in the distance. A woman, her face serene and at peace. She looked at us for a moment, then disappeared. I returned to the lighthouse feeling a weight lifted off my shoulders. The tapping, the whispers, and the feeling of being watched were gone. The lighthouse felt like a different place, free from the torment of Eliza's spirit. Tom and I stayed in touch, and he continued his research on the lighthouse and its history. He published a book about our experience, which gained a lot of attention. People started visiting the lighthouse, curious about the legend of Eliza and the haunted lighthouse. But the story doesn't end there. A few years later, I received a call from Tom. He sounded shaken. He told me that he had been experiencing strange occurrences, the tapping, the whispers, the feeling of being watched. It seemed that Eliza's spirit had found a new target. Tom and I knew we had to act fast. We returned to the lighthouse, hoping to find a way to break the curse for good. We performed another seance, this time with the intention of freeing Eliza's spirit from the lighthouse. As we performed the ritual, we heard a loud crash from the attic. We rushed upstairs to find the wooden figurine shattered into pieces. In that moment, we knew the curse was broken. Eliza's spirit was finally free. Tom and I left the lighthouse, feeling a sense of relief and closure. We had faced our fears and put an end to the torment that had haunted the lighthouse for over a century. I still visit the lighthouse from time to time, and it no longer feels like a place of fear. It's a place of peace and reflection a reminder of the past and the power of the human spirit to overcome even the darkest of fears. And every time I look out at the ocean, I think of Eliza, finally at peace.
I never imagined that my quiet life as a lighthouse keeper would turn into a living nightmare. The remote lighthouse I tended to was nestled on a rugged cliff overlooking the vast, churning sea. The year was 1985, and technology hadn't yet crept into every crevice of our lives. I was isolated, but I preferred it that way. The lighthouse was my sanctuary, a place where I could escape the world and find solace in the rhythmic crashing of waves against the rocks below. My name is Vernon Galt, and I had been the keeper of Seacliff Lighthouse for over a decade. The townsfolk in the nearby village knew me as a solitary man, dedicated to my duty. The lighthouse had a history of shipwrecks and rescues, and I took my role seriously. I was the guardian of the sea, ensuring that no ship would be lost on my watch. One late autumn evening, as the wind howled outside and the fog rolled in thick and heavy, I settled into my routine. The lighthouse's beam sliced through the dense mist, casting an eerie glow over the dark waters. It was a night like any other, or so I thought. The first sign that something was amiss came when the radio crackled to life. It was unusual for me to receive any signals, let alone in such bad weather. The voice on the other end was distorted and faint, but I could make out a few words. Help. Stranded. Danger. My heart raced as I grabbed the receiver and tried to make contact. This is Seacliff Lighthouse. I hear you. Can you repeat your location? The voice faded into static, leaving me with an unsettling sense of dread. I peered out the window, but the fog was too thick to see anything beyond a few feet. I decided to investigate, hoping to find the source of the distress call. Grabbing my flashlight and donning my heavy coat, I ventured out into the cold night. The wind whipped around me, carrying the salty scent of the sea. As I made my way down the narrow path to the cliff's edge, I heard a faint cry for help. It was coming from the direction of the old abandoned cabin, a place I rarely visited. The cabin had a sinister reputation among the villagers. Stories of ghostly apparitions and unexplained disappearances surrounded it. I had always dismissed them as superstitions, but now, with the distress call fresh in my mind, I couldn't ignore the possibility that someone might be in danger. I pushed open the creaky door and shone my flashlight inside. The cabin was a shambles, with broken furniture and rotting floorboards. The air was thick with the smell of decay. I called out, Is anyone here? A faint whisper echoed through the room. Help. Please. I followed the sound to a small trap door hidden beneath a pile of debris. With a deep breath, I lifted the door and descended into the darkness below. The narrow staircase led to a cramped basement, and the air grew colder with each step. At the bottom, I found a young woman, bound and gagged. Her eyes widened with terror as she saw me. I quickly untied her and helped her to her feet. She was trembling, and her clothes were torn and dirty. Who did this to you? I asked, my voice steady despite the growing fear in my chest. She managed to choke out a few words. He's coming. We have to get out. Now. As we made our way back up the stairs, I heard a low, menacing laugh. It sent a chill through my spine. I turned to see a shadowy figure standing at the top of the stairs. His face was obscured by the darkness, but his eyes glinted with malevolence. Going somewhere, Vernon? The figure sneered. I recognized the voice. It was Malcolm Hargrave, a former lighthouse keeper who had disappeared years ago under mysterious circumstances. He had been presumed dead, but here he was, alive and evidently deranged. Malcolm lunged at us, brandishing a rusted knife. I shoved the young woman aside and faced him, my heart pounding. He was strong, but desperation gave me an edge. We grappled in the confined space, the knife flashing between us. I managed to knock it from his hand and land a punch that sent him sprawling. Run! I shouted to the woman. She bolted up the stairs and I followed, leaving Malcolm writhing on the floor. We emerged from the cabin into the stormy night. The fog was thicker than ever, but I knew the path well. We stumbled back toward the lighthouse, Malcolm's maniacal laughter echoing behind us. I could hear him crashing through the underbrush, closing in. As we reached the lighthouse, I slammed the heavy door shut and bolted it. The young woman collapsed in a chair, sobbing. I handed her a blanket and tried to calm her down. You're safe now. We'll call for help. She shook her head, her eyes wide with fear. You don't understand. 
He won't stop. He wants us both dead. I picked up the radio and tried to make contact again, but all I got was static. The storm was interfering with the signal. We were on our own. I turned to her and asked, What's your name? Rebecca, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. Rebecca, we're going to make it through this, I assured her, though I wasn't sure if I believed it myself. We huddled together, listening to the storm rage outside. The lighthouse's beam continued its steady sweep, a beacon of hope in the darkness. Hours passed, and the adrenaline began to wear off. I could see the exhaustion in Rebecca's eyes. Just as dawn was breaking, there was a loud bang on the door. Malcolm's voice boomed through the wood. You can't hide from me, Vernon. I'll find a way in. Rebecca and I exchanged a terrified glance. We had to come up with a plan. The lighthouse had a small arsenal of flares and signal guns used for emergencies. I handed Rebecca a flare gun and showed her how to use it. If he gets in, aim and fire, I instructed. It's our only chance. She nodded, her hands trembling as she gripped the weapon. I took another flare gun and positioned myself near the door. We could hear Malcolm trying to break it down. The wood splintered under the force of his blows. The door finally gave way, and Malcolm burst in, his eyes wild with rage. I aimed the flare gun and fired, the bright light momentarily blinding him. He roared in pain and stumbled back. Rebecca took her chance and fired her flare gun as well, hitting Malcolm square in the chest. He screamed and fell to the floor, writhing as the flare burned. I seized the moment to tackle him, wrestling the knife from his grasp and pinning him down. You'll never get away with this, he spat, his eyes filled with hatred. We already have, I replied, my voice steady. Rebecca and I tied him up and waited for the storm to pass. When the weather finally cleared, I was able to make contact with the authorities. They arrived within hours, taking Malcolm into custody and ensuring Rebecca received the medical attention she needed. As the police led Malcolm away, I couldn't help but wonder what had driven him to such madness. It wasn't until later that I learned the full story. Malcolm had been obsessed with the lighthouse, believing it held some ancient power that could grant him immortality. When he was dismissed from his post for erratic behavior, he had faked his own death and gone into hiding, plotting his return. His mind had twisted over the years, turning him into a dangerous madman. The abandoned cabin had been his hideout, and he had lured Rebecca there, intending to use her as a sacrifice in one of his deranged rituals. In the aftermath, the townsfolk were both horrified and grateful. The lighthouse had always been a symbol of safety, and the thought that it had harbored such darkness was unsettling. But they took comfort in knowing that Malcolm was behind bars, and that Rebecca and I had survived. Rebecca and I stayed in touch after that night. She moved away from the village, unable to bear the memories of what had happened. As for me, I remained at the lighthouse, but things were never quite the same. The solitude that once brought me peace now carried a tinge of unease. Every time I climbed the stairs to the lantern room, I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder, half expecting to see Malcolm's shadow lurking in the corners. The lighthouse had protected many lives over the years, but it had also hidden its share of secrets. Secrets that would continue to haunt me for the rest of my days. I remember that night like it was yesterday, though it happened almost three decades ago. My name is Finian, Finn to most, and for nearly 20 years, I was the lighthouse keeper at Seal Rock, a remote outpost on the northeastern coast. It was the kind of place where time moved slower, where the world seemed to forget us, and where the ocean's whispers were your only company. On this particular night, the fog had rolled in thick and heavy, a smothering blanket that swallowed sound and sight. I'd been battling a cold for a few days, feeling more run down than usual, but duty called, and the light needed to be tended. The routine was comforting in its monotony. Clean the lenses, check the oil, ensure the beacon cut through the murk to guide ships to safety. I was alone, as I often was, save for my dog, Blue, an old loyal mutt who had been with me since I took the post. It was late, perhaps just past midnight, when I first heard it, a faint, distant sound that didn't belong. At first I chalked it up to the wind, 
the way it sometimes howled and moaned as it swept across the rocks. But this was different, more rhythmic. A muffled thump, like footsteps on the rocky shore. Blue's ears perked up and he gave a low whine, his eyes reflecting a wary curiosity. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out into the cold night. The beam cut through the fog in a narrow cone, illuminating the dense mist that seemed to close in around me. The sound grew clearer as I approached the edge of the cliff, my heart pounding with an uneasy mixture of fear and curiosity. Hello? I called out, my voice sounding small and insignificant against the vast expanse of the sea and sky. There was no answer, only the relentless thump, thump, thump of what I now realized were footsteps. But whose? No one should have been out there. I edged closer to the path leading down to the rocky shore, each step feeling heavier than the last. The fog clung to me, and I shivered, not entirely from the cold. Blue stayed close, his body pressed against my leg, a low growl rumbling in his throat. Then I saw him, a figure shrouded in the mist, standing at the water's edge. He was tall and gaunt, his clothes hanging off him like rags. Something about his posture, the way he stood so still, made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I called out again, more forcefully this time. Hey, who's there? The figure turned slowly, almost mechanically, and began to move toward me. The way he walked was unsettling, his movements jerky and unnatural, like a puppet on strings. My flashlight flickered, and for a moment I was plunged into darkness. When the light returned, the figure was gone. I felt a cold sweat break out across my forehead. I wasn't the kind of man who spooked easily, but this was something else. I backed away, keeping the light trained on the spot where the figure had stood. Blue growled again, more insistent this time, and I knew we had to get back to the lighthouse. Inside, the air felt warmer, but no less oppressive. I locked the door behind me and bolted it, something I'd rarely felt the need to do. Blue paced restlessly, his eyes darting to the windows. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease telling myself it was just my imagination, the fog playing tricks on my mind. The next few hours passed slowly. I sat by the radio, half-heartedly listening to the static, and tried to read, but I couldn't focus. My thoughts kept drifting back to the figure on the shore. Who was he? And why had he been out there? I felt a gnawing sense of dread, like something was about to happen, something bad. It was almost dawn when the radio crackled to life, startling me from my uneasy thoughts. Finn, you there? It was Captain McTavish, the old fisherman who lived in the nearest town, about twenty miles down the coast. Yeah, I'm here, I replied, my voice sounding strained even to my own ears. You all right? You sound off. I'm fine. Just a rough night. Did you need something? There's been some trouble couple of folks from town went missing last night. We're organizing a search party, but thought I'd give you a heads up. Keep an eye out, all right? Missing people. That explained the figure on the shore. Maybe they were lost, disoriented by the fog. But why hadn't they called out to me? Why had they disappeared when I saw them? Will do, Cap. Thanks for the warning. As the sun began to rise, the fog started to lift, revealing the rocky coastline in all its rugged beauty, but the light brought no comfort, only a stark clarity that heightened my anxiety. I decided to go back down to the shore, see if I could find any signs of the missing people. Blue and I made our way down the path, the morning air crisp and cool. The tide had receded, leaving behind a stretch of wet sand and seaweed. I scanned the area, looking for footprints or any indication that someone had been there. And then I saw it. A piece of fabric caught on a jagged rock, flapping in the breeze. I picked it up, my fingers brushing against something sticky. Blood. My heart sank. This wasn't just a case of lost hikers. Something bad had happened here, something violent. I followed the trail of blood, my footsteps heavy with dread. It led to a small cave, partially hidden by the rocks. Blue hesitated at the entrance, his body tense and alert. Stay. I whispered, not wanting him to get hurt. I ducked inside, the darkness swallowing me whole. The air was damp and musty, and the only sound was the drip, drip, 
drip of water echoing off the walls. I switched on my flashlight, the beam cutting through the gloom. The sight that greeted me made my blood run cold. Two bodies lay sprawled on the ground, their faces contorted in fear. I recognized them, Mary and Tom, a young couple who had recently moved to town. Their throats had been slashed, and their eyes stared up at the ceiling, lifeless and empty. I stumbled back, my mind reeling. Who could have done this? And why? I needed to get back to the lighthouse, call for help. But as I turned to leave, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I spun around, my flashlight clattering to the ground. There, standing in the shadows, was the figure from the shore. His eyes glowed with an unnatural light, and his mouth twisted into a cruel smile. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice low and menacing. I didn't wait to hear more. I bolted from the cave, my heart pounding in my chest. Blue barked and followed close behind, his eyes wide with fear. We ran all the way back to the lighthouse, my mind racing with questions and fear. I locked the door behind us and grabbed the radio. This is Finn at Seal Rock. I need help. Now. Two people are dead, and I think there's a killer out here. The response was immediate. We're sending a team, Finn. Hang tight. The next few hours were a blur. The police arrived and I led them to the cave. They questioned me, took my statement, and assured me they would find the killer. But as the days turned into weeks, the investigation stalled. There were no leads, no clues, nothing to explain what had happened. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease, the sense that something was still out there, watching and waiting. The figure's words haunted me. You shouldn't have come here. What did he mean? And why had he killed Mary and Tom? Months passed, and life at the lighthouse returned to a semblance of normalcy, but I couldn't forget what I'd seen, the horror of that night. I started keeping a journal, documenting everything, hoping to make sense of it all. One evening as I was writing, I heard a knock at the door. Blue growled, his hackles raised. I opened the door cautiously, my hand on the doorknob. Standing there was a woman, her face pale and drawn. Are you Finian? she asked her voice trembling. Yes, can I help you? I need to talk to you. It's about the man you saw, the one who killed those people. My heart skipped a beat. Come in. She introduced herself as Emily, a historian who had been researching the history of Seal Rock and its lighthouse. She had uncovered some disturbing information about the previous lighthouse keeper, a man named Samuel. According to her research, Samuel had gone mad and killed several people before disappearing without a trace. His body was never found, and his spirit was said to haunt the area, seeking revenge on those who disturbed his resting place. I listened in stunned silence, the pieces of the puzzle falling into place. Samuel was the figure I had seen, the one who had killed Mary and Tom. He was still out there, a restless spirit, driven by madness and rage. As Emily spoke, I felt a chill run down my spine. The lighthouse, the fog, the cave... It all made sense now. Samuel's spirit was trapped here, doomed to repeat his terrible deeds. And I was the latest in a long line of victims. But I wasn't going to let him win. I decided then and there to confront Samuel, to put an end to his reign of terror. With Emily's help, I gathered the tools I needed. A Bible, holy water, and a crucifix. That night we made our way to the cave, determined to lay Samuel's spirit to rest. The air was thick with tension as we entered the cave, our footsteps echoing off the walls. I could feel Samuel's presence, a cold, malevolent force that seemed to seep into my bones. I held the Bible in one hand, the crucifix in the other, and began to recite the prayers Emily had taught me. The air grew colder, and the shadows seemed to close in around us. But I didn't falter. I kept praying, my voice growing stronger with each word. I felt a surge of energy, a sense of purpose and determination. Suddenly there was a flash of light, and Samuel appeared before us. His eyes burned with fury, and his mouth twisted into a snarl. But I didn't back down. I held the crucifix out in front of me, my voice steady and unwavering. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I command you to leave this place. Return to the darkness from whence you came. 
Samuel let out a howl of rage, but he couldn't resist the power of the words. Slowly he began to fade, his form growing fainter and fainter until he was nothing more than a wisp of smoke. And then he was gone, the cave silent and still once more. Emily and I stood there, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. It was over. Samuel's spirit was finally at peace. We left the cave, the weight of the past lifted from our shoulders. In the days that followed, life at Seal Rock began to change. The fog seemed less oppressive, the air lighter and clearer. The town slowly recovered from the tragedy, and I found a sense of peace I hadn't known in years. I still keep the lighthouse, but now I do it with a sense of purpose, knowing that the spirits of the past are at rest. And every night, as I watch the beacon cut through the darkness, I remember the horror of that night and the courage it took to face it. It's a story I'll never forget, a story I'll carry with me for the rest of my days. I always thought being a lighthouse keeper was a lonely but peaceful job. The isolation had its charm, a sort of tranquil solitude that let me escape the noise of the world. But there are places in this world where tranquility turns to terror, where solitude becomes suffocating. I found this out the hard way, in the fall of 1998, at a remote lighthouse on the rocky coast of Maine. My name is Thomas, and I had been the keeper of Whaleback Light for about six months when things started to go awry. The lighthouse was old, built in the late 1800s, and had a history of eerie stories, but I never paid them much mind. Ghost stories were just part of the folklore that kept us entertained during long, stormy nights. One evening, after a particularly grueling day of maintenance, I settled into my small quarters adjacent to the lighthouse. The wind howled outside and the waves crashed against the rocks, but inside it was warm and cozy. I had just finished my dinner when I heard a faint tapping on the door. It was unusual for anyone to visit the lighthouse, especially after dark. Opening the door, I was greeted by a young woman, soaked to the bone. She had a wild, desperate look in her eyes. Please, she gasped. You have to help me. My husband, he's gone mad. I ushered her inside, gave her a blanket, and sat her down by the fire. Her name was Emily, and she and her husband, Jacob, were staying in a cabin not too far from the lighthouse. Jacob had always been a bit of a recluse, she told me but lately he had become obsessed with the old stories of the lighthouse. He believed there was something living in the waters around the lighthouse, something ancient and malevolent. I assured Emily that it was just the isolation getting to him, but she was adamant. She described how Jacob would spend hours staring out to sea, mumbling about voices calling to him from the depths. Then, last night, he had vanished. She found strange symbols carved into the walls of their cabin, symbols she had never seen before. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I tried to stay composed. Let's go find him, I said, grabbing my flashlight and a jacket. Emily looked relieved, but still terrified. We headed out into the night, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The path to the cabin was treacherous, slick with rain and mud. Emily led the way, her steps hesitant but determined. When we reached the cabin, it was eerily quiet. The door was ajar, creaking slightly in the wind. Inside, the cabin was in disarray. Furniture was overturned, and the strange symbols Emily mentioned were indeed carved into the wooden walls. They looked ancient, almost runic, and emitted an uneasy energy. We searched the cabin, calling Jacob's name, but there was no response. Then we heard it a faint, rhythmic chanting coming from the direction of the lighthouse. Emily grabbed my arm, her eyes wide with fear. That's him, she whispered. We made our way back to the lighthouse following the sound. It grew louder and more distinct as we approached. The door to the lighthouse was open, and inside Jacob stood at the base of the spiral staircase, his back to us, chanting in a language I couldn't understand. Jacob, Emily called out but he didn't react. She ran to him, shaking his arm, but he remained unmoved, his eyes glazed over, fixed on something we couldn't see. I reached for the radio to call for help, but the moment I did, the lights flickered and died. We were plunged into darkness, with only the beam of my flashlight providing a feeble glow. 
The chanting stopped abruptly, and Jacob turned to face us. His eyes were empty, devoid of any recognition or sanity. Before I could react, he lunged at Emily, knocking her to the ground. I grabbed him, trying to pull him off, but he was unnaturally strong. He screamed incoherently, his fingers clawing at Emily's throat. Desperation fueled my strength, and I managed to pull him away, sending him crashing into the wall. He lay still, unconscious or dead, I couldn't tell. Emily was shaken but alive. I helped her up and we stumbled out of the lighthouse into the storm. We made our way back to my quarters where I barricaded the door and tried the radio again. It was dead, just like the lighthouse. There was no way to call for help. The next few hours were a blur of fear and confusion. Emily sat huddled in a chair, her eyes never leaving the door. I kept watch, my mind racing with questions. What had happened to Jacob? What were those symbols? And most importantly, what were we going to do? Just before dawn, the radio crackled to life. It was faint, but I could hear a voice. Someone was trying to reach the lighthouse. I grabbed the mic and shouted for help, explaining the situation as best I could. They promised to send someone as soon as possible. As the first light of dawn broke through the storm clouds, we heard footsteps outside. Emily clung to my arm, and I raised my flashlight, ready for anything. The door creaked open, and two men in raincoats stepped inside. They were from the Coast Guard, responding to my call for help. They took one look at us and knew something was terribly wrong. We led them to the lighthouse where Jacob's body still lay. They examined him and shook their heads. He's gone, one of them said, but it was the look on their faces that told me there was more to it. They called for more assistance, and soon the place was swarming with authorities. Emily and I were taken to a nearby town where we were questioned for hours. I told them everything, about the chanting, the symbols, Jacob's madness. They listened, but I could see the skepticism in their eyes. Days turned into weeks, and the investigation dragged on. They never found a satisfactory explanation for what happened. The official report said Jacob died of unknown causes, possibly brought on by extreme stress and isolation. But Emily and I knew better. We had seen the darkness in his eyes, felt the malevolence in those symbols. Emily left Maine soon after, unable to bear the memories of that night. I stayed on, but things were never the same. The lighthouse seemed colder, the nights longer. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting. Years later, I heard rumors about similar incidents at other lighthouses along the coast. Stories of people driven mad by whispers from the sea, of strange symbols and ancient chants. I tried to put it all behind me, but the memory of that night haunted me. One day, while cleaning out an old storage room in the lighthouse, I found a journal. It was hidden behind a loose brick, covered in dust and age. The journal belonged to one of the first keepers of Whaleback Light, a man named Elias. As I read through his entries, my blood ran cold. He described the same symbols, the same chants, and the same descent into madness. Elias wrote about an ancient entity, a being that dwelled in the depths of the ocean. It called to those who lived near the water, drawing them into its madness. He believed the lighthouse was built to contain it, to keep it from spreading its influence. But over the years, its power had grown, and the containment was failing. The last entry in the journal was dated October 31, 1898, exactly 100 years before Jacob's death. Elias wrote about a ritual to strengthen the containment, a ritual that had to be performed every century. But he had failed, and the entity's power had surged. I closed the journal, my hands trembling. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place, but the picture they formed was terrifying. The entity was still out there, and it was only a matter of time before it claimed another victim. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let what happened to Jacob happen again. Armed with the knowledge from Elias's journal, I prepared for the ritual. It was dangerous and uncertain, but it was the only hope of stopping the entity. On the night of October 31st, 1999, I stood in the lighthouse, the symbols drawn in chalk around me, chanting the ancient words Elias had written. The air grew thick with tension, and the room seemed to close in around me. 
but I pressed on, pouring every ounce of my will into the ritual. Hours passed, and I felt the entity's presence, a cold, dark force pressing against my mind. I nearly faltered, but the memory of Jacob, of Emily's terror, gave me strength. With a final, desperate effort, I completed the ritual. The air cleared, and the oppressive weight lifted. I collapsed, exhausted but alive. The entity's power had been contained, at least for now, but I knew it was only a temporary reprieve. The ritual would have to be performed again, and the knowledge passed down. I wrote everything in a new journal, detailing my experiences and the instructions for the ritual. I hid it in the same place I found Elias's journal, hoping that the next keeper would find it in time. Years have passed since that night, and I am no longer the keeper of Whaleback Light. But I still keep in touch with my successor, a young man named Sam. I told him everything, and he understands the responsibility he has taken on. The lighthouse still stands, a silent guardian against the darkness that lies beneath the waves. And though I have left that life behind, I can never forget. The entity is still out there, waiting for its chance. And I can only hope that when the time comes, those who follow will be ready. In the end, it wasn't just about keeping the light burning. It was about keeping the darkness at bay. And that is a duty that never ends. The wind howled outside the lighthouse, rattling the old glass windows. The sound was unsettling, but after 15 years on the job, I was used to it. My name is Frank Merrill, and I was the keeper of the Turner Point Lighthouse, an isolated spot on the rugged coast of Maine. The lighthouse was built in the early 1900s, and by the time I took over, it was a relic of a bygone era. My main job was to keep the light burning, ensuring the safety of ships navigating the treacherous waters. It was a quiet existence, one filled with solitude and the constant hum of the sea. My only company was a black Labrador named Jack and the occasional passing fisherman. Most of my days were spent maintaining the lighthouse, recording weather data, and making sure everything was in working order. The nights, though, were a different story. They were long and dark, filled with the eerie sounds of the ocean and the creaking of the old lighthouse. One particularly stormy evening... I was sitting in the kitchen, sipping on a cup of coffee and listening to the radio. The news was the usual mix of mundane reports and local gossip. Suddenly, a piece about a missing person caught my attention. A young woman, Elizabeth Hayes, had vanished without a trace from a small town a few miles inland. The report said she was last seen leaving her workplace late at night. I turned off the radio and stared at the flickering flame of the oil lamp on the table, it wasn't unusual for people to go missing around these parts. The dense forests and rugged coastline could easily swallow a person whole. Still, something about this case felt different, unsettling. I couldn't shake the feeling that Elizabeth's disappearance was somehow connected to the lighthouse. A week later, my routine was interrupted by the arrival of a stranger. It was rare for anyone to come all the way out to Turner Point, especially in such terrible weather. The man was tall, with a weather-beaten face and piercing blue eyes. He introduced himself as Detective Jameson, investigating Elizabeth's disappearance. Mr. Merrill, he began, I'm here to ask you a few questions about the night Elizabeth Hayes went missing. I offered him a seat and poured him a cup of coffee. Sure thing, Detective. I'll help in any way I can. Jameson took a sip of his coffee, his eyes never leaving mine. Did you see or hear anything unusual that night? I thought back to that evening. It had been stormy, with waves crashing against the rocks and the wind howling through the cracks in the old lighthouse. No, sir. Just the usual stormy night. No visitors, no strange noises. The detective nodded, but I could tell he wasn't entirely convinced. Mr. Merrill, do you believe in the supernatural? His question caught me off guard. Can't say that I do, Detective. <laughs> I've spent too many nights out here alone to believe in ghosts or monsters. Jameson leaned back in his chair, studying me. Well, I've been hearing some strange stories about this place. People say they've seen lights in the woods, heard voices on the wind. Some even claim the lighthouse is haunted. I chuckled, 
shaking my head. Just old wives' tales, detective. The lighthouse is old, and old places make strange noises. He finished his coffee and stood up. Thank you for your time, Mr. Merrill. If you think of anything, please give me a call. As the detective left, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling his visit had left me with. That night, as I made my rounds, I kept thinking about Elizabeth Hayes and the strange stories Jameson had mentioned. The wind was fierce, and the sea roared like a wild beast. I climbed the stairs to the lantern room, the light from the beacon casting eerie shadows on the walls. Suddenly, I heard a faint sound, like a whisper carried on the wind. I stopped, listening intently. The sound grew louder, more distinct. It was a voice, a woman's voice, calling for help. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed the sound down the stairs and out into the stormy night. The wind was fierce, whipping my coat around me as I stumbled through the darkness. The voice grew louder, more desperate. It seemed to be coming from the edge of the cliff, where the land dropped off into the churning sea. I peered over the edge, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. There, clinging to a narrow ledge, was a woman. Her hair was matted with seawater, her clothes torn and soaked. She looked up at me with wide, terrified eyes. Help me, please, she cried, her voice barely audible over the roar of the wind and waves. I dropped to my knees, reaching out a hand. Hold on, I'm coming down. Carefully, I inched my way down the slippery rocks, my heart pounding in my chest. When I reached her, I grabbed her arm and pulled her up onto the cliff. We both collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath. Thank you, she whispered, her voice shaking. I looked at her closely, recognizing her from the news reports. You're Elizabeth Hayes, aren't you? She nodded, tears streaming down her face. Yes, I was taken, held captive in the woods. I managed to escape, but I've been lost for days. We made our way back to the lighthouse, where I wrapped her in a blanket and gave her a hot cup of tea. She told me her story, her voice trembling with fear. She had been abducted by a man who lived in a cabin deep in the woods. He was a madman, obsessed with the lighthouse and the legends surrounding it. He kept talking about the light, saying it was a beacon for something evil, she said, her eyes wide with terror. He said he had to stop it, to keep the evil from spreading. My blood ran cold as I listened to her. I had always dismissed the stories as nonsense, but hearing them from Elizabeth made them all too real. I called the detective, telling him everything Elizabeth had told me. He promised to send help immediately. As we waited, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The wind howled outside, and the old lighthouse creaked and groaned. Elizabeth and I huddled together in the kitchen, the only light coming from the flickering oil lamp. Suddenly there was a loud crash, followed by the sound of footsteps on the stairs. My heart pounded in my chest as I grabbed a heavy wrench from the table. Stay here, I whispered to Elizabeth, creeping toward the door. I opened the door a crack, peering out into the dimly lit hallway. The footsteps grew louder, closer. I tightened my grip on the wrench, my palms sweaty with fear. As the figure rounded the corner, I swung the wrench with all my might, hitting the intruder squarely on the head. He crumpled to the floor, and I stood over him, my breath coming in ragged gasps. It was the madman, the one who had taken Elizabeth. His eyes were wild, filled with a madness that sent chills down my spine. You're too late, he hissed, blood trickling from the wound on his head. The evil has already awakened. The detective arrived shortly after, taking the madman into custody and escorting Elizabeth to safety. I was left alone in the lighthouse, the weight of the night's events pressing down on me. As I climbed the stairs to the lantern room, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed that the lighthouse would never be the same. In the weeks that followed, life returned to a semblance of normalcy. The lighthouse continued to stand guard over the treacherous waters, its light a beacon of hope for passing ships. But the stories of Turner Point took on a new life, whispered tales of madness and supernatural forces that kept even the bravest souls away. I remained at my post, ever vigilant, my nights filled with the haunting memories of that stormy night. And though I tried to dismiss the stories, I couldn't ignore the sense of unease that lingered in the old lighthouse. 
It was as if the very walls held the echoes of the past, the whispers of those lost to the sea. One evening, as I sat in the lantern room, watching the light sweep across the dark waters, I thought back to the madman's final words. The evil has already awakened. I couldn't help but wonder if he was right, if the lighthouse held more secrets than I could ever imagine. The wind howled outside, a mournful wail that seemed to carry the voices of the past. And as I listened, I realized that the true horror of Turner Point was not in the supernatural, but in the darkness that dwelled within the human soul. Elizabeth Hayes was eventually reunited with her family, and the madman was locked away in an asylum, his ramblings dismissed as the ravings of a lunatic. But for me, the lighthouse keeper of Turner Point, the memories of that night remained a constant companion, a reminder of the thin line between sanity and madness. Years later, as I prepared to retire and leave the lighthouse behind, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness. Turner Point had been my home, a place of solitude and peace. But it had also been a place of darkness, a place where the line between reality and madness blurred. As I locked the door for the last time and walked away from the lighthouse, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was leaving behind a part of myself. The wind whispered through the trees, carrying with it the ghosts of the past. And though I tried to leave it all behind, I knew that the memories of Turner Point would haunt me for the rest of my days. The lighthouse stood tall against the sky, a silent sentinel watching over the sea. And as I looked back one last time, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets it still held, what stories it would tell to those who came after me. But that was a mystery for another time, another keeper. For now, I was content to leave the past behind, to move forward into the unknown. And though the memories of Turner Point would never fade, I took solace in the fact that I had survived, that I had lived to tell the tale, the end.